Oops. All right. Oh, I think everything is probably working. And once I verify, I can close various windows with various portions of my head pointing at it. You know, it's been a month since I did any live streaming. The last one we did was the end of November and be jiggered if the entire YouTube studio has not completely changed and required you to use their new, not entirely great interface. Um, I mean, I guess it's probably good for what it is, but it seems more complicated than the one where you could just click a button and go live. Anyway, um, various things look like I'm doing something. We are attempting to uh, use the webcam for the first time, and uh, we're going to see how well that works in the context of this particular stream. Um, all right, I'm going to say that this seems to be working, so I'm going to close that window now. All righty, so uh, if you are watching this part of the live thing or you're watching this uh, when it uh, comes by around again on the replay later on, um, this is the first time that I'm using the webcam in this uh, whole streaming operation, and I'm playing around with using uh, OBS Studio in uh, studio mode instead of in just uh, simple mode. So all sorts of perhaps crazy stuff may happen here uh, in this particular operation. And uh, to be honest, I haven't... Uh, oh. 100% uh, decided what uh, what all should be happening in the stream tonight. Um, you're probably going to see me uh, looking over there a bit because I this is something I actually do uh, a fair bit when I'm streaming. The monitor to my right is the one where I keep my web browser, the chat, and the uh, OBS uh, window itself. I have the main monitor right in front of me here. Over there on my left, I have... Uh, another laptop and a monitor, but they're unrelated to this. And way over to there, where you can't see, I have uh, a MacBook, which is still uh, showing what the live studio is because uh, that's just how this whole streaming operation has to work now. And then back there, you can see I have uh, a cloud uh, thing and cloud uh, HP notebook, cloud book, stream book, stream cloud, cloud stream, something like that. Uh, and there's uh, another one out in the other room. But uh, this is uh, my general work setup. You can even see uh, various things behind me. There's uh, some Christmas stuff that's uh, ready to go back in. The cool uh, bookcases, guitars, piano, all sorts of uh, great stuff. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a work in progress to come up with a distinct work area for creating videos and doing live streams that isn't just my general work office where I don't really have the capability to shift computers around or have a particular area. So we'll see how that all works out in the end. Um, but I think we're probably going to go ahead and jump on into the appropriate thing here. And that is probably, I would guess, not that, but this one uh, right here. And okay, we are getting ready to go ahead and jump into the live stream. It is actually uh, 8 o'clock. Check that out. It, the stream health is still excellent. I am impressed, hopefully, with the frame rate that this cam. It, uh, webcam is pulling here. Uh, in the preview, it seems uh, pretty snappy, and in tests that I did prior to this, it seemed uh, pretty good, considering that it's supposed to be super awesome and shooting out uh, H.264 video in a nice high quality, but it turns out that Logitech doesn't want anybody but them to talk to their webcam, so it seems like uh, what it actually does is shoot out uh, MJPEG stuff with actual H.264 attached to it, so only software that knows how to get at the inner data can have the highest quality stuff. So we'll uh, we'll see what we got going here because I am uh, doing these live streams from Linux. But uh, in any case, I'm going to go ahead and uh, line my mouse over up on this button and say, welcome to live stream uh, 48, the 1st of January 2020. That's the right year, right? Yeah, that's the right year. I, I got it together. <laughs> Thank you. 
And uh, I think the volume on that may have been perhaps <clears throat> a little a little large. Uh, I tried to tweak it a little bit. Uh, apparently, uh, OBS Studio uh, has had this ability to use a Stinger video uh, as a transition for a few months now, but one of the features they forgot to add to it was the ability to adjust the audio level. And it's one of those, hey, it would be nice features, hasn't been implemented yet. Um, so I tried to recreate a different version of the video that had a little bit of a quieter volume, but I don't think I took it quiet enough. So if your ears blew out on that, I apologize. Or maybe that's the good volume level and this is a quieter volume level. It's it's hard to say. Um, Alrighty, so in this particular, uh, oh, I can't even do that now. Oh, okay, there we go. Okay, so I have to switch back out of uh, studio mode now that I've pressed the magic uh, stinger button there. I believe the whole reason I was doing that um, was strictly because there's no way to do a scene transition between scenes with different transitions other than flicking around in that little thing there. As I said, it's a, a work in progress, but uh, <laughs> hello, fellow Sublime Text fanatics, and uh, welcome to the live stream. As I said, this is the first version where there's a, a copy of uh, me sitting uh, down here uh, in the bottom right of the window. And uh, it seems like it's not too shabby of a size. Maybe it's a little bit uh, too large. I might have to um, squinch that down a little bit. That is what this test stream is uh, all about. Because I have to say... Uh, December was uh, a long month. We were doing November, working on things uh, every day, but I also had uh, a lot of uh, work stuff happening in the first two weeks uh, of December because I had the last two weeks of December off, and that's when holiday preparations kicked in full bore, and uh, as a result of that, uh, I didn't have a lot of free time to do much of anything except my hour of November work. There's videos on the other channel, link down in the description if uh, you haven't seen uh, those videos. Leading up to the idea that sometime uh, soon in the new year here, we're going to kick off a video series on the other channel on package and plugin development, covering in more explicit detail the sorts of things that I've been doing here in the live streams for uh, I guess it's about a, a year now, give or take. I'm going to try to also make sure that I always do this uh, once a week as well. There has been a few times, um, obviously, since I've been doing it for a year, and this is only a live stream 48, there were some uh, periods where I didn't do one, not counting uh, December, uh, because uh, I had uh, a lot of other stuff going on. But uh, I'm going to try and make sure that I do this on a, a regular uh, basis as we get back into that. And uh, so, yeah, well, this is the uh, test to see how well does the camera work, how well does the uh, the lighting work, and uh, all of that good stuff. Now's a good time to make sure that my microphone's actually uh, turned up to an appropriate level, I suppose. That's one of the things I normally do a pre-flight check for before I go live, but uh, yeah, it was a little, a little weird. I jumped into the live stream uh, thing and it told me that I could totally go to the new live stream studio where in order for OBS to be able to stream, I had to give Chrome the ability to talk to my microphone and webcam. It was uh, it was a little weird. The user interface could you know, use a little bit of tweaking. Um, so I said I didn't really have a heck of a lot to... Um, planned per se for the evening except for doing this test there's a few things I've, I've been thinking of and i haven't really had uh i think that's probably where i went in that long ramble i haven't really had a lot of time to just play with plug-in stuff uh, like i said that i was sort of doing that for november for the first couple of weeks working on a sudoku game and a, a gzip type uh operation uh for opening and closing gzip files in sublime and then i got into the youtube uh thing which still works, uh, presumably. There we go. I could pick one of these things and copy the link to the clipboard and then go ahead and paste it. And I had other stuff I was going to do there, but uh, OAuth, it was uh, a real bear. And uh, one of the things I discovered about that, actually, is it seems to be against Google's terms of, terms of service to have OAuth client IDs in uh, open source software because anybody that has your client ID could conceivably pretend to be you, even though. Theoretically, I guess you could get the client ID anyway if you're an installed application because there's no way to keep it a secret. And, uh, so 
don't expect to see that uh, appear on package control anytime soon or if that uh, does work so i'm going to keep working on that uh, in my spare time mostly for my own use but if i didn't turn that into a sublime text package it's probably going to require everybody that uses it to set up their own uh, uh, app on the Google console. Um, but apart from that, uh, I haven't really had time to just actually sit and play with Sublime and do fun stuff. I, I sort of missed that these uh, last couple of days I've been helping people on the, the forum and whatnot. So uh, away, we, away we go on that. Now, one of the things that I was thinking of, actually, and something that, this was something that was actually mentioned in the, uh, the Discord. If I was to create, say, a package report, with override audit, and we were to uh, fire up the context menu. Maybe if I put the cursor up here, that would look a little nicer. Um, there's only this one option in here for refresh package report, and if we were down here and we did it, then we could try to create an override in that, and you know, we can do that there. And if we also had, oops, that's not the right button. I pushed the O instead of the P. If we had an override report, then in oh, in this, uh, if I open this again, we can see there. We can just refresh the report. But in in the package, there's these three options, and here there's these options for things that are override audit related. Now that's well and good. But all of these other options, like, well, I guess this one, origami, close the current pane, makes sense. Sublimerge, there's no options available in that menu. Show date picker. Um, I didn't even know that was a thing, to be perfectly honest. I wonder where that's coming from. Um, but if it's going to insert something in, that doesn't necessarily help. Similarly, this doesn't apply in this. This isn't a subversion thing. I could turn word wrap on and off if I wanted, and I could copy and I could select all. These, all these options in here are all sorts of examples of things that don't necessarily need to be in this menu because they, they don't apply here. Um, it doesn't have a file, so you can't open its containing folder or that or that. Uh, the turns out um, we might be able to do something about that. So one of the things I was going to play with for just a little bit is seeing um, how we might uh, uh, go about doing that. And I think the easiest way to do that, hmm, there's a, there's a, we can define our own menus. And there's actually, as I understand it, a setting that I could use for this. So let's say we open the context menu like so. And we actually want, yeah, that one. So these are the ones that only appear in the editor. Create, oh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, these definitely are things that only appear in, uh, for example, the uh, override report menu. Uh, create override bulk diff refresh override report. Oh, actually, I guess that's that one. Aud override audit create override. Yeah. Uh, the same commands appear in multiple menus, and they might have slightly different actions associated with them. So um, bulk diff of a single package. What we could actually do is save as this thing. And save it as override reports dot sublime dash menu like so. Um, and this is something that I haven't actually uh, tried before. So this is going to be uh, sort of an interesting ride. Now what we need to do is find the code that is actually responsible for creating the reports Oops. Yeah. report generation thread um, oh I guess it's going to be in all of them isn't it okay um, we'll do it in this one first okay uh, da, da, da. so what we're going to do is this is what sets the content of a report. And I'm going to do this to make that bigger. Oh, look at that. That that area of the screen right there totally fits. So 
Yeah, nice. Still kind of uh, in the way. I can say this code right here. Uh, oh, shoot. This code right here. Eh, 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 that's what we're going to change. I don't expect to see that very often because uh, clearly I don't know my left from my right. It's on that side when I look in the preview, but it's on that side if I knew that my right is my right. Um, this uh, this report thread here uh, abstracts away. It's it's based on the report generation thread, uh, which abstracts away all the idea of spawning a background thread, collecting all of the information that is needed for it, and then actually doing something with that information, which here is creating information about report, uh, overrides and generating that override report. And the last thing it does is specify what the title of the report should be, what the content of the report should be, what its type is, uh, which is, as we can see here, a setting that's applied so that various context items know that they're in a report of a particular type. One of the nice things uh, about Sublime as a platform like this is you can Instead of trying to track yourself what files contain what things, you can just apply settings and re refer to those, which is nice because settings persist in a view even across restarts until you explicitly remove them or the file is closed. So unlike something like a global variable in a plugin, uh, which would go away when you quit or whenever the plugin reloads, this information hangs around. And then we're specifying the syntax that's going to be used. And then this is a list of all of the settings that should be applied. So this sets it uh, what packages appeared in the report, uh, whether which ones of the packages are expired, and uh, overrides that are known to be unknown. And that's just so that when you're using that context menu, it can refer to this. Because this thread right here, this is the only thing that has information on all the stuff that appears in the uh, actual report. So we're persisting it in a setting so that other things, uh, in particular the uh, hover pop-up, uh, can get at the information that it needs. We could add another setting here, and I'm not 100% sure how this works, but I'm, I believe I've been told it's named context menu, and the uh, file was, uh, and I'm not entirely sure. I think it needs to be named packages override audit, and then it would be resources, and then. Uh, just override reports. There's it in menus too. No, it's menus. Menus override reports. Dot sublime dash menu. Okay, and oh, why is it doing that? Hmm. File manager is broken. Uh. Am I embedding Markdown in that? I'm gonna I'll check into that later. Um, okay, so we reload. Ooh, that did not go as one might have expected. In load module, in core loaded, set up override mini diff, in set up mini diff, and check potential override. Crunk on a cracker. Um, I'm gonna quit and restart. Because uh, I don't remember when the last time was that I did that. Uh, all right, that seems to be okay. Uh, uh, and when we say we want an override report, if I right click, I get no context menu. No context menu. Okay, so that may not have been the appropriate way to pull that off. But whatever we're doing, it's doing something. Um, because it no longer displays a context menu, although it does over here, just not in that. And if I was to create, say, a package report, then it works there. And if I said view.settings.erase context menu, it's back. All right, so. That might not be the way to set that particular thing up. And uh, I'm not entirely sure how that should work then, because I think that's something that's actually not documented, if I remember correctly. What happens if I reload this plugin now, by the way? Does it work a little better? Let's clear the console. Whoops. 
Ooh. Oh, file manager, you kill me, man. You kill me. Okay. And set up override menu. Okay, I'm going to have to check that because I may have. One of those two things is not like the other, right? The package file might be missing. Uh, da, da, da. Are any of these things overrides? I don't think that they are. Um, well, let's look into that first uh, as an actual problem that r requires some kind of fix. Um, and then we can worry about the thing I was going to do. Um, and we'll see how that goes for us. Um, well, let's see, we want core.py. Whoops. That is annoying too. I'm, I wish I knew which, what was doing that. Opening a markdown file is what's doing that, isn't it? Is there something? I don't have an override on the markdown package. One thing at a time. Core.py at line 249. Check potential override. Oh, I see. Line 180. Shoot. Well, we'll just go over here. Shipped packages path package file. That's the line, right? One of these things is none. Easy enough to check. I'm going to just do a little bit of that. And then we can quit and restart. I see we don't want to have a problem with it now. Oh, that's irritating as all get out. Why? Do, uh, I can't remember if I did something that caused that to happen. Um, oh, well, I guess probably this maybe. Yeah, that whole thing. Oh, sheesh. Package info dot shipped packages path is none. That can't be good. That's a variable what's like right here. It's set to none there. Uh, is why would this just suddenly not uh, work the way that it used to work? Is the important question of the hour. Ah, now is the time when we slouch in our chair and ponder what we have wrought upon ourselves. On the plus side, this allows me to face directly into the camera as I stroke my beard as if I understood what exactly was going on here. What about this is happening? Um, I honestly can't remember uh, how this is supposed to work. So let's see. Um, Core.loaded is what we're actually interested in here. This is where we call package info.init. So it would seem that something's get, getting recreated before. It says initializing. It says that there. I do that. Clear this so that we can get a better sense of what's happening. Hello, Ashwin. 
Welcome to the new stream, where I'm confused at how my package no longer works, but I'm uh, not 100% sure why that might be the case, um, because I'm pretty sure I didn't change anything. It says it's initializing package info, and um, you would think that if you called package info.init, um, then this init method would get called and then it would set um, the shipped packages path to something that's not none and then it wouldn't throw an error about it being none but you'd be wrong because that's not actually what happens so uh, let's do a little bit of this then I suppose whoops exe path and print you know, Uh, check potential override is uh, really making me uh, unhappy here. Okay. So let's see. Well, that totally looks like it has some values. Um, and yet, and yet it doesn't have a value, even though this call very clearly sets it to have a value. Um, let's check that again, shall we? In the core, in check potential override, it's calling package info ship packages path. Oh, actually, I guess I could just do this, couldn't I? Yeah. It's printing this, and at the point where this is happening, shipped packages path is none, so you can't join it, but um, it should have called that thing that it is. Um, does it do that from a fresh restart is the interesting question, because I think automatic package reloader uh, was updated sometime in the last month or so. Oh, look at that. It's getting called a bunch of times. Or something is getting called a bunch of times. That might be the cause of some consternation, I suppose. Let's create an override report and take a look at Oh, yeah, that's right. I totally broke that, didn't I? Hang on. <laughs> yeah. Whoops. Okay. Default.sublime package, and that's the location. Yeah, see, so that works all nice. Okay, now with this file open, and I quit, when I restart, it seems to still work. It still knows about that. Okay, so that's nice. Um, I suppose what I should do here is, uh, let's see, we'll remove that because we don't care. And it's the only thing that was there. I'm going to open this repository just to see what files are actually changed because if there's going to be anonymous prints in here, I suppose I should know what they actually are. Uh, so we might say the XC path is this. I test uh, override audit. Uh, primarily, I end up testing it by accident, if you will, because I write a thing and then I leave it for a while. And I always have it up to date on my Linux boxes and my Windows machines and my Mac OS machine. So I end up testing it manually that way. I don't have any sort of automated test stuff set up for any of the packages because I'm one of those old school developers that was writing programs before the idea of test driven stuff came along. So I sort of getting into that now at work, but it's not something that I normally do for better or for worse. Um, but all else being equal, I expect the thing that used to work to continue to work if I didn't change anything. So I'm assuming that this is uh, an outside vector that's 
causing me problems. Um, and this is check potential override, right? Yeah, okay. I, I want to see why that's being called so many times because I think the shipped packages path shouldn't be changing. Check potential override looks like this. Okay, so if I quit that and quit that and click this button and open this console, what do we see in here? Check potential override thinks. Okay, so that all seems to be okay. So I think the issue might be package automatic package reloader um, because Randy made some changes to it so that it would support Python 3.3 and Python 3.8 plugins. And I don't think I've done any development work that required me to use it on something this complicated since then. Um, so we see the executable path is that. It's clearly set it up. And then, now this could well be uh, an issue in my code that just happens to work um, for what that's worth. I think because that didn't work, I, yeah. You see, normally you wouldn't be able to do that any longer. Now, I think eh, I have this set up so that it will automatically reload itself. And in that case, it works. So whatever I'm doing to reload this actually works. And something that automatic package reloader is doing makes it not work. Um, but... That might, mm, th this code depends on this being called, and it is being called, but it might be, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm going to not worry about that for the time being, because that's just, that's some weird business right there. Um, so let's not worry about that per se. Oh, he also extracts it as a, that's interesting. It's now a package that, ex that isn't installed as, hmm, maybe that's an issue. It used to just be a package that installed itself as an installed package, and now it's installing itself with no Sublime package, but there's still a file there. So I'm going to remove Automatic package reloader. Oh, wait, there's two of them now. There shouldn't be any breaking changes for ST4. No, because it's still set to run in the older runtime. And uh, that's what I'm running right now. So except for I just noticed that if you use automatic package reloader to reload it while you're editing it, I haven't seen um, any problems with it per se. There's... Huh. Gee. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna just test something here. Um and what do I what was I gonna do? What was I gonna do? I'm going to I'm gonna do that and this just to dump this package out. Um, by and large, I don't. I think existing packages should continue to work with the new version of Sublime without any problems, because of the two plugin hosts and the only API changes, in theory, that have been made are only applied to the new plugin host. Although that said, there were some bug fixes that I think apply to both of them, and as a result of that, I've noticed um, weirdness can't import progress bar. I'm not surprised that you're not working. Okay. Um, because if I was to create, oh, actually I already have one, don't I? Override report. Okay. Automatic package reloader is not there anymore. That's nice. Um, oh, I thought I had one. A package report for a thing. Okay, so if that's the case, then why is it getting all 
Oh, maybe that was part of its reload. Okay, we'll give it one more, one more refresh. And that all seems to be doing what we expect it to be doing. Everything worked just fine. Okay. There's no automatic package reloader at all in here. And then I install package. Download that package list. Download it, I say. And we go ahead and... Uh... By the way, Ashwin, what do you think of the uh, the webcam? Does this seem like it's too big in the screen? Should it be smaller? I, uh, I was eyeballing it the last time I was playing with this near the beginning of December when I had a little bit of free time. And uh, then I realized maybe it might be a little bit larger than one necessarily needs for this sort of operation. But it does require me sizing a window to a certain size and then cropping part of it away. So I was sort of loath to do anything in the general case. Uh, let's reload this in package. And we'll see. I'd like to know. Um, yeah, it... Uh, Resource automatic package reloader, bloop, not found. It has problems loading itself, so that's maybe telling to some degree. Automatic package reloader is now only an unpacked package. It's not installed and unpacked. So we actually may have just uncovered a bug in package control, one might assume. Um, if I was to push this key now, well, let's clear the console. If I push the key now, um, hmm. Well, to be honest, I was expecting more stuff to happen. Uh, what if I did it over here? Run reloader in Python 3.3? Oh, oh no. Reload current package. Does that do anything? I don't think it's actually reloading anything now, so that might be uh, that might be uh, an issue, um, or maybe it just doesn't. Uh, no, see if it was reloading, then we would see initializing Sublime, because uh, if it reloaded the package, we would see something along the lines of, oh, good gravy. Whoops. No, 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 do it over here. When this file gets changed, it auto reloads itself, and then we see it saying things like shutting down and initializing and skipping an automatic report. So if I was to push the key here and it just says that, it's not actually restarting anything. So maybe we need to go check the settings to see if there's something in here. Always open the console. False. Only relevant when open console is false. Okay. No, there's no setting in here that looks like it would cause uh, something to not work, except for how it doesn't seem to do anything. And file manager. Ah. Uh, File manager is on my list of things to either create a PR of some sort because these bugs are driving me crazy or create my own so I don't have to use it anymore. Um, <laughs> it seems to not be checking that a view doesn't have a window. This seems to be, uh, incidentally, one of those things that seems like it might be an issue in the newer version of Sublime where it didn't used to be, where it's a view sometimes doesn't have a window associated with it. And I don't know why that would be the case, because at least for non-transient views, that should never be the case. But it seems like something may have changed there. That could be an example of a breaking change if you use it in the new version of Sublime. But in that case, I think, you know, at some level, I, you can only do so much, right? Uh, so it looks like if we're going to do this, we're going to have to do it ourselves for the time being, and we can't rely on automatic package reloader. So if that's the case, then let's go ahead and discard that hunk and both of those. And well, we'll leave that one there for the time being. Uh, what was the other file? Oh yeah, that menu file that didn't work. And we'll reload that. Cool. Okay, so back to the thing we did that broke stuff. Um, <laughs> 
specifically that was override reports that I did that, wasn't it? Let's close that to and that and create an override report. Okay, so that is unfortunate. Now, I don't think it's documented that context menu setting. Did it appear anywhere is the question. Uh, it's not listed there. Oh, is it somewhere in the default package, maybe? One of the packages? I guess what we could do is verify that this is actually the correct path, right? That might be something that's worth doing. Although I would expect to be to see some sort of error in the console if that was not correct. Well, I mean, that looks like it's the same, but I'm not proud. I'll, I'll do this. And then come back to this and save this file. And then come over to this override report and create a new one, I suppose. So that'll do what I want. So, oh, to be honest, it was mentioned by someone in the Discord that context menu was a setting, but not what it actually does, or where it was found. Oh, maybe it shouldn't have, oh, maybe that's my issue. Okay, I think I see what I did wrong here. It should not have this part on it. I think it should just be this. That might be why this doesn't work. Okay. All right, well, that seems to be swank. All right, so we can, we can get a little bit of that action going if we were uh, to want to. That is an example of an experiment that may actually have gone uh, well. Oh, I need to close that or I won't be able to see the chat. All right, so uh, in case you weren't here uh, for the uh, initial part of the stream here, uh, the idea here is currently all the reports in Override Audit, like say this package report, have all of these context menu items associated with them, even though a lot of them aren't going to make any sense. like. This isn't a file that's backed on disk, so you can't send do any operations with SFTP. Um, I guess you might want to check out a subversion file while you were looking at a report, but I don't know why you might want to. Word wrap is something I added in here myself. You can't show unsaved changes because it's not a file that's on disk. You can't cut or paste, you could only copy, and you could also select all if you wanted to, but you can't open the containing folder, copy the path, reveal it in the sidebar because it's not a file on disk. So except for the origami option to close the current pane or do various things, uh, none of these menu items in here actually has really any effect on anything. So it seems like we could make life better by having override audit just display its own context menu here it wouldn't have to have override audit in it it would only have operations that actually matter um, oops there we go now this is the menu as we have it here we don't need to have a caption at the top of it um, because it doesn't have uh, any items that come before it because it's its own menu and we might add an ID of override audit or something like that. Um, and then I suppose what we could also do is open the context menu over here and say we might want that. Uh, 
here. Those will merge together. We don't need cut or paste. We could do that. So over here, we can select all we can copy. Now what we have to do here also is the these item menu items don't have captions associated with them um, because the command is generating it, which is not necessary for something like refresh override report. Well, I guess it kind of is because this, uh, we'll see here the refresh report command doesn't take any argument. It's inferring that it needs to do that based on knowing that this is an override report in the menu, but it doesn't need to apply that prefix of override audit because it's its own menu. So that's one thing that needs to change here. Um, we could do that in all of the reports that we're generating. So like we could do it in a package report and an override report. We wouldn't, and a bulk diff. We wouldn't want to do it in the actual, uh, yeah. we wouldn't want to do it in the actual context menu for overrides. Uh, well, that's a bad example of that, but you know, <laughs> because there's actual items in there that it, it is a file on disk. Um, but what we could do is let's override, let's change it to override audit report like so, and rename this file to override audit report like so. And then we can remove that and Copy that, and along with the override report, there would also be a diff report, like so, which is going to have a very similar line in it, like so. And um, what was the other report that I said there was going to be? Package report. Oh, I got to figure out what's going on with that. Uh, because that is irritating. Every time I open a markdown file, it generates a warning. And, yeah, oh my goodness. Hmm. Oh, here it is. There's only one here. That's the problem. There we go. Okay, so if that was something, let's create a new window. And say we want a package report, and we want an override report, and we want bulk diff of all packages. Then over here in the package report, um, we maybe um, should have done that a little smarter by, say, actually reloading the plugin, let's say, um, and then create the new window and say we want a package report and an override report and a bulk diff of all packages. And then refresh bulk diff report we can create override in bulk diff in right on. Now, this seems to be uh, the sort of thing that we would want, I think. And if we were to actually open like this file here, if we were to edit this override, um, then it should have all of the items in here. We can open the container. It does have a path. We're actually, this is a file we're actually editing, right? So that's sort of the thing we might want to do for that. Um, and in that case, we do want this bit to be here. Uh, incidentally, the reason why I have override audit as a prefix is solely due to the fact that, uh, as we saw before I made this change, if you have a parent menu like this with children and all of the children hide themselves, then the parent is still there and you just sort of get a little empty menu. And I don't like that from a user experience perspective. Um, it looks a little bit nicer now that Sublime is using GTK3 instead of GTK2 because in GTK2 it renders an empty menu with a single thin pixel line. Now it actually tries to make it look like a little tiny menu with nothing in it. But regardless, I don't think that menu should appear there if it doesn't do anything. Um, and you know, SFTP was another example of a thing that did that, which is why I'm adding that prefix. So if we want to have these items in the context menu and we want to have them in our own menu over here, but over in our own menus, we don't want that prefix to be on there, but the command needs to generate its own prefix in order to know 
what it's doing, then we need to come up with some way for the commands that are in the package to be able to know that they should apply the prefix or they shouldn't apply the prefix for what they're supposed to use to generate their thing. And I guess uh, for the purposes of actually demonstrating this, because I'm talking about it, but you might not be familiar with how that actually works. Um, if we look for context, uh, oh, it's not going to be in there, is it? Oh, all right. So say we command context create override has a description method like this. Okay. Now, if a command has a description method, it has to take the same arguments as run takes and other commands like is visible and is enabled is visible is enabled description and run all have to take the same arguments except that run gets an edit and none of the other ones do because edit is something that's given to the command as it's actually being executed but the idea is given a menu item or command palette entry that has arguments associated with it. Sublime knows what the command is and what arguments it's going to get. So it will call is visible to, ser to see if this command should be visible or not. And one of the things it gets is all of the arguments that that command would get if it was executed so that the command can decide if it's visible or not depending on the situation that it's being called with. And similarly for is enabled, uh, the to Sublime calls that to ask the command if it should be enabled or not. If it's enabled, it's uh, something that the key, a key binding will activate and it's something that a menu item will allow you to pick and it'll appear in the command palette. If it's disabled, it appears in the menu as a grayed out item um, like you know one might expect, of course. You know, that one there, for example, is an example of a command that's disabled. Disabled commands don't show up in the command palette. Disabled commands can't be invoked uh, by the, a key. And uh, interestingly enough, both of these will be invoked. So even, even if uh, a command is not supposed to be visible, Sublime can still ask it if it's enabled because maybe you don't want it to display in a menu, but you still want to invoke it with a key. Uh, one of the other things in that regard that will be called is description. Description gets the exact same arguments as the command would get when it's executed, and it can return the, uh, the menu the caption to use in the menu for that command. Sublime only calls the description method if there's not a caption in the menu item. So if you add a caption here, this won't get called. If there's not a caption, then description does get called, and you can use it to decide what it is that you want to uh, display in your caption. So you can see here, for example, in override audit context create override command, which is something that you'd see if you were to, say, open any old package file and then right click this says override this re resource it's saying that because this the context in which this command is being executed isn't a package it, it has the cursor has to be on a package for self.package to be set to something so it doesn't know what to do with that so it just returns the default of that but if we were to open a package report and i'm going to have to Scoot that over here so we can see it. If I do it here, now it says create override in, and it knows the name of the package because it inferred it from the caret location. So based on all of that, we want these commands to be able to generate their own descriptions uh, because it needs to be specific in some cases just for nice user experience. You know, every time you pick this, you sort of get that positive affirmation that you right clicked it on the package that you intended to right click it on. If I was trying to do something in package automatic package reloader and I was a little bit too far down, I might be picking the wrong thing. Sometimes you don't need to do that and sometimes um, a command might be able to display that information but if it's displayed in a situation where it doesn't have the information, it might just do something generic. So a couple of ways around this. The first one that might come to mind is what if 
all of our commands had an argument that said what the format of the description should be. And if you didn't specify a description, it would use the one that's hard coded. And if you did specify, it would use that instead. Then we could leave the code alone, the existing context menu that you know would be seen in these commands if they were you know invoked somewhere that wasn't inside one of our reports would still add the override audit you know override this resource like we saw but if it was used from inside of our menu up here then we could specify our own little format the problem with that is this sort of thing right here this particular command has two different things that it could be using and we don't necessarily know in the menu that that's the case and if that is the case then it seems like the commands themselves need to be a little bit smarter about what they do um, we could envision the idea that if the context menu setting that's allowing us to even use this menu in the first place if that setting is set then it doesn't need to imply it doesn't need to add that override audit thing because it it's in its own menu file presumably you know that that's what it's going to be right because all the other items are gone I kind of like that from a cleanness perspective although it does require every description method to change but I don't know if that seems like, sometimes things come down to the lesser of two evils or in this case, the lesser of three evils. I could do nothing. And then this menu just says redundantly tells you information that you don't need to know. Or we try to add multiple arguments to commands or we make it so that it just works smarter. Um, and since this, the idea of this whole stream is just to sort of play with plugins and have examples. So I didn't really have uh, any specific ideas for something to technically get done, but this is something, uh, this whole setting was mentioned by someone in the Discord, Victfall, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, as something that would be useful, and I totally agreed with them. I'm not 100% sure that this actually works in Sublime 3, actually, now that I think of it. It might be worth checking that, I suppose. So let's try that. Huh? <clears throat> and see how well it works over here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh huh. None type. Oh, look at that. I totally did a thing. Okay. Uh, 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 uh. Good grief. There we go. There, there, there. And... Made a package report. Yeah, nope, that totally works here too. Okay, that's kind of what I thought. <clears throat> now that's an example of something that should not have changed. Current view went away while it was doing something. Well, we won't. No sense borrowing trouble. Let's fire that back up. Yeah, yeah, I am aware. Okay. So we know that'll work. We know that'll work. Now, I have... Actually, let's do that. Um, this still seemed to be uh, excellente. Right on. Um, ba -ba -ba, what was I looking for? Context helper. Did I not... Uh, Oh, sorry. I guess I should have did that. It's probably why that didn't work before. If you don't press the right combination of keys, the command doesn't do what you might want. Okay, so this magic command uh, class here uh, is something that I created because I have so many commands that I want to work in a context-sensitive way, and there's a lot of ways for that to work. Um, and examples of that would be checking what's under the cursor 
to be able to see what's the what's the item under the cursor does it look like a package or does it look like the name of a resource based on the scope that it has and if so extract the value and then we'll be able to know and if we know that it's a uh, an override or a package resource we need to know what package it's actually from so we would need to um, look up through the file in the case of a override report to be able to see um, if we did a little something like you know that this knows what package it's from uh, because it can look back backwards from the position where the cursor is to find the first line that scope to be a package. This knows it's a package because of the scope of the text that's underneath it. Um, this one can tell what it, that it's a certain kind of override because of the syntax around it. That's a limit, another uh, thing that we might need to do. And also, um, if you wanted to have a context menu that appears in a tab, which, uh, yeah, do I still have that file open over here? The the one where we uh, we got it to add, oh yeah that's right it closed because I reopened the file didn't I yeah there's there's two different uh, this is the context menu and in that case uh, you might want to know that information and if you do something in the tab of a file then the command gets different arguments because the focus is still over here. If I see like the, the this file has the focus, and then when I click over here, this view gets the focus, and then the menu opens. So the context menu always opens in the context of the actual file that the menu is associated with. But when you do it on a tab, the focus is still over here. So this command needs to be told more information. It needs to be told what file group, you know, 0, 1, 2, and what index this view has into that group, 0, 1. So this would get a group of 1 and an index of 1. And using that, you can ask the window, please give me the view from group 1, index 1, and it gives you this view. And then you can do stuff like know what the view is and that sort of thing needed to happen in a ton of commands and as a software developer of uh, quite some time my policy is be as lazy as possible why write the same code 14 times if you could write it once and then never have to look at that sort of thing again um, and then there's also that whole, you know, invariably you discover some horrible bug. And if you have two or more places where the same code exists in your code base, I'm going to bet uh, better than even odds that when you decide you need to fix a bug, you're going to forget one of them and be remarkably confused for an extended period of time. Um, so that's another reason to do that. So I have that, uh, that file, which, uh, I have already forgotten the uh, the magic of the thing. Oh, that was probably in the core, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, this context helper class takes care of all of that information. So we see here it can figure out if there's a package at the current point or if it's an override and find the package for the override at a specific situation. So it figures out where the mouse cursor is and finds the package and then it can like look backwards to find um, information, stuff like that. Uh, if we need to know what sort of report type we're in, you know, uh, if we're in a override report versus another kind, there's a setting for that. So this can return that information so we don't need to worry about it. Does this package contain expired overrides? Well, that's easy to tell because we add them as a setting so that uh, we don't have to look them up after the report has been generated. We need to be able to figure out where, what view is the target of this particular operation, which as we can see here, um, if there is a view, then use that. Otherwise, if the group is minus one, oh, sorry, if the view, use the view if the group is minus one, which it will be. Um, and this is, if you ever looked at the tab context menu, all the commands in there generally have uh, a group and an index if they need to work on a specific file. I'm looking in the wrong direction. Uh, you set them to minus one in your menu item, and then Sublime will replace them with the actual group and index. As we can see that there, um, if it, it actually executed that way. So 
it has those as default arguments. So if the command is used in a non-tab context that's minus one, then it just uses the view that it knows about. And otherwise, it pulls it that way. And then here's all of the uh, information for this sort of action. View context, it returns a command context for the provided view, and it needs to figure out the name of the package and the name of the override in a few different ways. Um, one way is if it's looking at a report, um, like so, then it knows that this is definitely the override because you right click the cursor on it. It knows this is definitely the package because you right clicked the cursor on it. If you were to open this particular file in an edit, it still knows what override this is and what package it is because there's settings in the buffer that tell it that this is an override for a particular package. Um, so that's an, uh, another example of something that happens there. I'm going to close uh, a bunch of these files because they're sort of going a little crazy here. And we'll worry about fixing all of those in just a second. Um, maybe do that over here too. We're going to leave that. Um, I don't want to close this because I might not remember that it's there. We'll close both of those as well. This is another example of something that I need to add to the scraps repository, but I keep forgetting. Okay. Um, so my theory is uh, we could add another little helpery thing to this. Um, this is an example of these commands take an argument right now of always visible, um, which we set to false here, but the default is true. And always visible, as we can see here, gets the setting, gets the argument and returns true if the thing isn't set. Um, that's because for my own purposes in the context menus that we're creating things, I want those menu items to only appear if they are valid. And if they're not valid, I want them to go away. But you, as the user of Override Audit, might want those menu items to still be there. You might decide you want to modify the context menu to have them inside of uh, an Override Audit section the way that the way I don't like it. You might like it that way, and then you might want those commands to always be visible and just disable themselves. So I implemented this as an argument. By default, it would work that way, and I specifically set it to false in all my menu items to make it hide. And we could create something like def uh, caption prefix. We don't need arguments per se. Maybe. Um, this always has to apply, I think, to a text command. This doesn't work with window commands, if I remember correctly. But I should probably check that just to be sure. Do, do, do. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Text command. I think I tried it with a window command the last time I was playing with this, and then I quickly reminded myself that that doesn't work because it ne some code in there yeah, assumes that self.view is totally a thing. Um, so... We could say return that if self.view.settings.has context menu else override audit like so. Um, that might be a way to go. And then we have to reload the plugin. So now, theoretically, all of these commands could have a caption prefix on them. So if we had uh, an example thing, if I hadn't closed too many files, uh, for example, then we don't want we don't want it to appear in that, right? Uh, refresh override report and all of those. Whew, that's a lot of stuff, man. Let's test out the theory with refresh report um, and that is override audit refresh report. So we would say override audit refresh report command. That's that one. And let's go ahead and copy that. Now, this is probably a bad example of this at some level because 
Uh, well, no, no, I was going to say, uh, because this is always going to be in the context menu, but that's not strictly the case. Um, I'm thinking there could be a setting in override audit that tells it that it should apply the setting to make this menu be it's a context menu, um, which would be enabled by default, and you could flip it the other way if you want your it to appear in the standard context menu. Um, I, as you may have noticed, I uh, really enjoy making things um, configurable to the user so that everything works the way they want it to work. Uh, so <clears throat> this, um, we would, s oh yeah, this is only a one, right? So we might say prefix isn't something that exists in here, right? It's equal to self dot, whoops. Caption prefix like so, and then we find both of those and replace them with prefix. Oh, I guess we can't do it that way, can we? Okay, we'll do for the purposes of this, and then we can mod and prefix on that one and. Oh, shoot. Uh, I forgot to put one in here, did I? Nope, oh, no. I'm doing it in the wrong spot. Whew, that was a close call. I almost broke that. Da, da, da. This is the one. I was looking for percent report to do a thing. Uh, like so. Okay, now. In the immortal words of a guy that was pretty sure he broke stuff, watch this. Uh, so far, so good. Yay! Now that command can actually that method could actually be smarter and it could actually verify that it's the menu that it expects it to be. Um, but all else being equal, that's not too shabby, I don't think. It seems like it uh, it might be the business. Uh, Let's go ahead and give that a jingle. We're going to copy that line and I'm going to say find uh, like so. This would be a great example if I still had that key binding uh, set up because this is totally an example of one of those things where I might want to open all of these. Uh, one, bang, 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 bang. And after creating a video saying this was a bad idea, in this particular case, it's not that bad of an idea because I actually want the cursor to be at the position of all of these things, right? Um, so this is an example of one that actually doesn't need to change. I think this is the menu for if you are actually editing something that was a, uh, what's an example of that? Paste from history. Yeah, this one's an override, right? Um, so uh, da, da, da. diff this override. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, that appears here in the command palette in this particular case. Swap diff edit. Oh, swap diff edit of current view. Hmm. Hmm, that's interesting. I wonder if the. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I have vague recollections of that. Um, if you're editing an actual override, then um, you're actually of current override, override audit toggle override. This only applies to open views as it requires state information. Yeah, so it actually has to be something like this for it to appear. And here it knows it needs to diff. And in the diff, it knows it needs to edit. Um, so that is sort of a, Man, I gotta, 
I can't remember. I, I remember adding this whole operation because it's there's a very specific case where it was needed, but I can't remember what it is. But it re does require you to have an actual file open. So I don't think it's necessary to do this there. Revert this override. That looks like one that we totally want to fiddle around with. And then we say here, and here is percent %s, and then we percent prefix, like so. That should be the only one in here, because one command per file, because the brain, it rebels. Um, that's setting the caption. We definitely don't want to screw with that. Override report. We definitely don't want to screw with that. This is a description method, so we do want to put something in here. And here and here will be a percent %s. And then here we percent prefix. And here we do that. And close that out. I mean, some of this could clearly be cleaned up uh, to some degree. But when you're playing around with potential changes, things can whoops, change as you're going. So it doesn't necessarily help anybody to do it the more complicated way. Here's the example of uh, diff this override, edit this override. Hmm. Oh, actually, that comes from the inside of uh, one of these things. Edit override, boop, and diff override, boop. So th those items are what this thing is coming from. You see edit override and maybe the name of the uh, thing, and uh, maybe not, depending on if the file is actually open or not. So we will paste that and that. Oh, and that are percent s's, and then they go prefix like so. Close it, and there's only one here. And the world screams for how whoops weird it seems to me to have this set up this way when it could say percent as both diff package and then percent self dot caption prefix instead of having it as a value there. But you know, these are the sorts of things we change before we make commits. And in this case, there's two of them. So it would seem wrong to do that because then you might be calling the thing twice instead of once or something. Basically, I'm sort of a weird guy in the style that I use. I think is the uh, the magic of of that, or the takeaway of that. I haven't actually even checked how uh, how long is the stream going. An hour. That's not too shabby. Uh, I wasn't entirely sure how we might uh, get along on this operation, but so far things seem to be working fairly well. I'm kind of impressed. Uh, we're gonna close that one and. There's a nice sameness to this sort of thing, you know, until I look at it later and it bothers me. So there's, there's that. I thought the dog was barking but, or growling, but it turns out he's just snoring. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Percent S mod prefix. And that will be the last one. Create override in and override this resource. This is going to be uh, an interesting one for us to test um, because this is going to be the, the the acid test, if you will. Because create override in is the name of the package, right? Uh, which you would do here. It needs to add the prefix there. But if you actually had the thing open, those shouldn't be there. Oh, I guess that, um, shoot, close that one. 
that was the example of that uh, that other file where it doesn't need to have that. Is it over? I even spelled right there. Yeah, it is. Okay, we'll close that. I shouldn't have been closing those all along, by the way, because I'm pretty sure I'm going to find out that I did something horribly wrong there. And then we'll open override audit and save. Plugin reloads nicely, so that's good. So, um, hmm. Oh yeah, it's only going to apply in uh, actual reports at the moment, isn't it? There we go. Refresh this report. <laughs> Forgot what I was doing there. Create override in default. Does not quite work, but that seems to work, so that's nice. Um, we might want to, because we're doing this this way, put this up here. Maybe even eh, a little something like that. We can come back and add in uh, items like that too later. So refresh override reports always at the top. Bulk diff package default. And the same thing should happen if we do it this way. Override audit refresh override report. Okay, so that would be an example of this is the view that has the context. This is the view that has the um, the focus. So our little method is saying view settings get and this file doesn't have it. So that's an example of how that's probably not the correct way to pull this off uh, because if this has the focus then the tab says refresh override report but if this doesn't have the focus then it's still there but it has that prefix on it so that's a little that's a little something um create override in is not working uh properly but everything else seems to be in that report so that's nice so let's see create override in nope nope uh, should have turned on that Um, hmm. Why doesn't this one do what we would expect? Override audit, create override in that. Self.caption prefix, this is the view and it has the menu set. Is this an example of a report that was open from before? That code changed. No, okay. So that's that's good at least. Um, yeah. That's the only one that seems to have a problem. Let's bump out a package report. Refresh it. Create override in. Bulk diff. And it seems to be, oh, and I guess we should actually do, I think, a little something like that. Just so we can see, refresh, create override in, yeah, okay. And we need to actually pick one that actually has overrides in it. Um, and I don't know what a good example of that might actually be at this point. Ah, uh, it didn't default, I suppose. So that is create override in, but here, those all work the way we would like them to edit, delete. Mm, oh yeah, okay. So it's really just context create override that is not worth doing what we thought. Oh, the other, and it doesn't actually apply uh, to this, I don't think. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that would be uh, that would be a hell of a to do, wouldn't it? Um, okay, so why doesn't this do what we want? Let's look again at caption prefix. It's nothing if the view settings has context menu. 
uh, it has to have a context menu because we're seeing the context menu. For override audit context create override. Could that be longer? Probably. Hmm. All right. Well, I guess that, well, I mean, that really looks like the name of that command, I would have thought. Um, but it does not seem to be doing anything. This is one of those examples where we try turning it off and on again and see what happens. Good. That's interesting. Hmm. What are the possible reasons why that didn't seem to have any effect on anything? And if I had to guess, I would say that this is a command and it's a con oh. create override is not it, right? Yeah, it doesn't have a, it's a command palette command and the other one is the menu that does something with it. Um, in this init, the text context create override does not appear. And that is the, oh, see, we totally just found a bug. So first thing we're going to do is come over here, prefix a is going to be that. Okay, so now we know that I just changed the message that's printed there, right? And if I came over to here and save this, it theoretically reloads the package. And when I click here, that says prefix is blah, blah, for override audit create context, right? Okay, now with that said, if I was to come to this uh, file here, source.commands and inside there is edit override delete impression. Do I normally just throw this into a context create override is here. So the command gets repolled, but see the file doesn't. And that is the reason why that uh, it didn't reload that plugin. Edit override delete freshen. Um, yeah. We'll just put it over here, I suppose. Whoops. No, that's right. Context create override. I'm going to save that. Okay. Now I'm going to come over here to this and save this. And now when I do it over here, is going to be. So there we go. That's the reason why that didn't work. We totally just, uh, you know, had a horrible bug in our code. That's uh, that's usually how how that goes. Pardon me while I just uh, check over here to make sure that the stream health still looks like it is going well. And it appears uh, as though it is. So that's nice. Right on. Huh. I guess at some level using this live streamy bit is not too shabby in, in that regard but setting up the stream well, was more of a pain than I would have thought that it needed to be alrighty so I think that is more or less that change like done except for the part where this is you know broken um, this here shouldn't call self view settings um, it should, it needs to call view target. Um, I'm not sure what the best, uh, what the best way to go about that would actually be, come to think of it. Um. 
We can't call view target without having access to the arguments to the command, which technically we do if all of these things that changed wanted to pass in star star kwargs, it could look that up the same way that this does. That might be a better way to go with it. Because oh, again, uh, we want that that's a specific case, I think, of where we just always want it to be that, maybe, because that's a menu that's outside of our package menu. That might be a better way to fix that, but it does require having the keyword arguments. So the theory would be that this should take... If um, oh, actually, maybe we don't even need to. We could just say group equals minus one. If group not equal to minus one, and is that how we want to do that? If if the group isn't minus one, no, we want it to be minus one, excuse me. If the group is minus one and the current view has context menu set, then return nothing. Otherwise, return override audit, like so. Um, because the idea there would be, if we think about this, if the group is minus one, then the command was executed not from the tab context menu, so it has the default thing, but as soon as it is ex executed from the tab context menu, then group would be not minus one, and this would fail, and it would fall down to that, which should probably be correct if one had to guess. Okay, so if that was the case, um, then what we could do is come over to here and then um, we would uh, close all these files because we want to have to reopen them again in a second. And then we would save this and now everything is just broken. Uh, one would have thought. Oh, there's not actually any of those commands in this file, so that sort of works out. But here it says override audit. And here, it says refresh. Hmm. Oh, you know what? Because I'm not actually passing an argument. So, of course, it's just always minus one. Right, right, right. So, yeah, that's cool. It's not broken. It's just not actually doing anything we want it to do. That's, that's different. Refresh report is an example of something that needs to call it. Refresh report command in the description should call it with star star kwargs like this. So override audit refresh report. Okay, I sort of broke it in the other direction now. Let's double check that. Do that, do that. It's minus one. Still minus one. Okay, so I don't think that's necessarily doing anything either. Hmm. Refresh report is definitely in there. Bum, bum, bum. In the tab context, it definitely has those values. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I'm just sort of bogglingly confused at this point. Uh, apart for the course, this may be a more complicated thing than I should have been trying to play around with. Um, but what can you do, right? What can you do? Play with the fidget cube while we ponder that if the group is minus one and the view, the current view has the context menu. Group is always minus one. Right? It says it's printing minus one there. And if it's printing minus one, then this view doesn't have the setting context menu. The other confusing aspect of this, um, all things equal, is that this one shouldn't be getting called with minus one in that case. It should be called with something else. So what's the deal with that? What am I missing here? Why is group always minus one? For that command, no matter what. Excuse me for my yawn. Refresh. Yeah, this specifically says refresh, uh, ref override audit. Oh, hey, wait a minute. That's actually not calling description at all now. I just realized. Um, because the name it's showing the name of the actual command and not this. Let's try quitting and restarting to see if it generates any no errors. Whatever is happening is causing it to return an empty string. Just to double check. Caption prefix is that. Um, is it actually no prefix? I may have just added more complexity to this than it technically required. It should have the prefix, it just doesn't. And here it should have no prefix. Okay, so the problem isn't that. The problem is that this command description is returning back an empty string. And because it's returning back an empty string, Sublime is using the default. Print generic print actually refreshing and then we dupe that and when we do this it says refresh description method but it doesn't actually return which is interesting because it seems to me that there's no way for this to return without printing a statement. So something in here is triggering an exception or something, I think is the issue. 
of this whole operation. Do, do, do. Dylan is back in the Discord. Welcome to you, Dylan. Welcome to you. All right, so what could be going wrong here? It's returning prefix, so it's returning a not empty string using prefix this mod prefix. Okay, then we come over to here, we do a little bit of that, we, huh. Hmm. Let's go ahead and clear that. Refresh description method, and then it never says anything after it. So uh, it's printing that, but caption, the call to caption prefix is what's messing it up. Do, do, do. I guess the, uh, oh, here. Let's do this, and then we'll know exactly which one of these things is actually doing it. Refresh description method. It's not actually calling this. I guess I'm not allowed to specify it this way because it's getting more arguments. All right. I guess maybe I need something like this. Maybe that's the problem. That seems like it might be the problem. There we go. From inside the report, it definitely gets it. From the tab, it definitely doesn't get it. And even if we do it this way, it still definitely doesn't get it. But in here, it does. All right. So that is uh, that. Is that. Yeah, that was a little bit of a, a brain fart on that operation. And I think that should more or less see us using good stuff here clear out all of these prints thusly reload this thing and then okay so we do a little run through of all of the stuff in this um, other window close all of those so we could create a bulk diff of a single package and we could create a bulk diff of all packages and we could diff a single override like that one, and then we could um, uh, get a package report, and then we could get an override report, and then we could try to create an override like that, and then check all of the stuff. So that is prefixed like it should be, that's prefixed like it should be. All of those items are prefixed because they're not inside the file. That's what we would expect. Or not, whoops, shoot. Can't do that, can I? Yeah. That's an actual uh, thing here. And inside here, it would do the same. Nice. And inside here, it would do the same. Okay, the, the diff and that, I can flip-flop between the two. Oh, I know the uh, the toggle command is this one. But it's not in a menu. That's why it's not there. Whew, thank God. I was afraid I was going to go crazy. Okay, we can refresh the report. We can refresh bulk diff. We create override in. 
edit, 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 delete, delete, delete. That's looking nice. So the menu is just a lot cleaner in that regard. So I think, except for the fact that I'm not 100% uh, pleased with how it only does it in reports, right? It only does it in reports, right? It was the package report that we closed. So there, create bulk diff, create bulk diff, create bulk diff. Yeah, and it doesn't matter for these things because they've got their own little buttons here and no, no hover pops for that. All right, so that seems to be what we might refer to as dandy. How do you get, oh, sorry, I just noticed that now. I'm not sure, what, I should turn timestamps on in this chat here. Hang on a second. Yay, you just said that. Hooray! I normally turn that on too. How do you get all the override commands to appear below on opening the tab context menu? You mean like having them at the bottom of the menu like that? Is that what you're referring to? While we wait for the video stream to catch up with you, I'm going to open this repository. <laughs> Sixteen unstaged changes. Oh, heavenly, heavenly Father. Uh, oh, I'm on version two twenty. Oh, okay. Um, let us create branch and create a branch. Um, I'm gonna call this context menu changes, like so. Uh, the magic of that is just, uh, whoops, don't do it that way. Thank you. I didn't mean to type that. I have this tab context dot sublime menu file and it just automatically appends when sublime loads the tab context menu resource. And there are like a bunch of them. Like we did, uh, Sublime.find resource, I think is the name of the thing. Let's just go ahead and uh, find resources, excuse me. And we said tab context dot sublime dash menu. These are all of the package files that are contributing commands to the context menu and Sublime is appending all of them together in the order that they're seen. So it does the ones for the default package first, and then it does the ones from Sublimerge, then Override Audit, and then um, SFTP's uh, menu comes in here. So in this case, we don't have any, any of our items in here, and neither does any other package. Uh, but in here, we can see the items for Sublimerge appearing. Excuse me. And actually, it seems like uh, there should be some override audit commands that appear in that because this is a, an override, but I may not have actually. They happen there, but not here. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, there we go. Was it doing that a second ago? Ah, I kind of lost track of what I was doing. But in any case, uh, the menu files are concatenated together in order that they're loaded here. There is a little bit of a side wedge on that which is if we looked at I don't think it you know, default tab context menu this menu the default tab context menu just looks like this so prompting to open a file is the last now sublime 4 doesn't do that I actually have a I have a uh, configuration file that sets the syntax of this widget to be Python. And because it's Python, hyperhelp will actually work inside of it, which is sort of a handy benefit. Um, just before we jump away from the menu thing, normally when Sublime loads resources, it combines all of the different files of the same type together. So when there's like multiple key bindings, they're loaded in order. Um, color schemes and settings files overlay on top of each other in a specific 
load order. So default is always first, user is always last, that sort of thing. Menu files are loaded the same way, but there's extra stuff that can be done in a menu to target where the items are actually going to be. And if you looked at the main menu, uh, you can see some of the items in, oh, I hate that. Some of the items have these ID values on them that give them specific IDs in the menu. And if your menu file has one of those IDs, then your items get added at that point in the menu instead of being crammed onto the end. So for example, one of the more common things that you'll see in a package is something like this, where I have items in the tools menu, so I'm using the ID of tools because that's what's in that main menu. And that makes us able to add this here in the tools menu. It's still after all of the other packages that have been loaded that are in the tools menu or you know in alphabetical order because Subversion does that and so does HyperHelp Author, but this falls alphabetically between those two, so that's why it ends up in in that position in the menu. And the other common uh, thing to do that with is preferences, the ID for preferences, which is how you end up with adding your package to the package uh, settings menu item here. And that looks like that might not be displaying uh, quite uh, correctly there. I don't know if that showed up in the stream or not, but uh, that little tab bar there wasn't rendered all the way across. That seems like it might be a Sublime 4 rendering problem. Um, if we did user uh, main men uh, Sublime menu widget. Uh, nope, that's not, it's not a menu file, excuse me. Uh, this is an example of how you can set uh, menu items in, in a widget, for example, which is how I added those commands for clearing the console and being able to toggle word wrapping over here. Uh, that's not what you asked, though. Uh, we asked for user widget settings. There's a settings file you can create called console input widget dot sublime settings. The name is important and that is just a settings file like anything else because this widget down here is a view just like any other view. So you can apply a syntax to it. So I apply the sublime syntax to it and I have that auto match enabled turned on in there so that this works. So if you're typing stuff and you want to wrap it in quotes, this should be in quotes, you know, like if you pasted stuff in, you can select it all up and do that sort of action. So I added those two things in. You can also um, add settings in there if you want to be able to open the autocomplete, but that's sort of less interesting because the only content in this view is the, the one line. Um, I think if you look in the, if you search for console input widget in the Discord, somebody, somebody asked, yeah, uh, menu items can have uh, checkboxes. As a matter of fact, uh, for example, these are uh, examples of items that work that way, word wrap and spell check in the main menu. Uh, as I recall, the only commands that can do that are application commands. But we're over here. If we were in this window, we could totally say is checked. Like so, application command is the only command class that has this method. It works just like is visible, is enabled, and description, that stuff we were talking about earlier in the stream where if Sublime wants to know how something is, if it should be enabled or not, it calls is enabled. If it wants to know if it should be visible or not, it calls is visible. If it's in a menu and it doesn't have a caption, a description method is called. And if it has, if it's a menu item that has uh, the appropriate item in it, then it will call is checked to see if the checkbox should be shown next to uh, the menu item. And as we, have, we can even see here, the Sublime menu file has to have a checkbook checkbox attribute set to true. So again, that would be the sort of case where you say main menu like so. And if you search for checkbox, there's an example of that. You know, of those menu items for these sorts of things set uh, checkboxes and uh, indent using spaces, the various tab sizes, which are the menu items that are visible down here. 
as well as being visible up here somewhere in the menu. I can never remember where because I don't normally uh, I don't normally fiddle with that sort of stuff up here. Uh, selection, perhaps? No. Nope. View. View indentation. There we go. <laughs> Those menu items have that. You have to have uh, your command has to be implemented as an application command to be able to do that. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And in this particular case, the set setting command knows that uh, if its value is a boolean, that it will check off. It will. Ret it's is checked the <laughs> the is checked method of the set settings command will return true if the setting that you have it set to is upsetting that has a boolean value and the value that you're providing oh, no, that doesn't have to have a boolean value if the setting that you're trying to set it to is set in the current view and has the value that is the value that you're trying that menu item would set it to then it returns true so that's how this thing knows that this particular one should be marked that way um, and I like to turn off word wrap without having to fiddle around in the menu and I really should probably have added that to, to this, but since I, you know, tend to talk with my hands sometimes, I like to just whip into the menu and pull something like that off. Um, I think if you check the Discord, someone was asking about how I did this uh, particular action uh, sometime after the builds for Sublime Four, but I can't I can't remember exactly. I think it was J.F. Chung that asked how I pulled that off, and then there was some confusion. You have to be careful about this. Um, normally, uh, let's zoom that out again so we can... Oh, look, it's totally doing it again. Yeah, I can totally see it's not capturing that correctly until I do a little bit of that. Let's bring this over here. This console input widget is normally a settings file that doesn't uh, have anything in it console input widget there's one in oh yeah the context menu for the input widget is uh also something you can specify if you want to add something in there as well and you know that's how you can swap between those as you can see i added those to this context menu so that it works no matter which one that i hit it in but uh go back to that thing i was just doing console input widget settings there's the default one that sets the context menu that's used and you know all else being equal if i had remembered that this is how that works i wouldn't have screwed up the earlier part of the stream by making this a full package resource see it turns off autocomplete in this setting so if you wanted autocomplete to appear in here when you uh, press the appropriate key then you would have to also override this in your version of the file. But these are the only two settings that appear in this settings file by default. But if you use certain themes, then they might um, have their own version of this so that they can set settings to control the display of this. Because uh, unsurprisingly, if you wanted to, you could do a little something like say that the color scheme is set to whoops ah set to mariana for example and then the context the uh the thing down there would have a different uh color scheme than everything else in the window and uh, if you use certain themes and i don't know offhand what they are because i've just always used the default adaptive theme they might be doing something like this to be able to change things about this menu item this uh, thing here you might even be able to pull a little something like this to be perfectly honest i've never tried that's actually kind of clever um and if that was the case they might be setting a color scheme like i'm doing here and if it's if you watch that latest video on the uh, other channel i mentioned that sometimes plugin authors make hidden color schemes 
for their own use. Uh, one example of that would be if you wanted a color scheme to change the background color of this to be something very specific as part of your theme, you might have a color scheme that only knows how to syntax highlight one scope. And then if you were to set the syntax to be Python like this, the syntax highlighting doesn't work because there aren't any rules in that color scheme. Um, and that, that's one of the things that happened to J.F. Chern when uh, I, I think it was him. There, there was a, a couple of people that were you know, excited to learn about that when I shared some screenshots in the Discord a little ways back. And it turned out the reason it wasn't working for them was their theme was setting a color scheme. So if you do this, if you add this settings file and you're sure that the settings name is correct and you add the syntax into that part still doesn't work then make sure that you can add a color scheme to match it to the color scheme that you normally use and uh, that would probably fix that up does this have the actual it just just shares the font right no it doesn't hmm oh yeah it does okay yeah you could have a completely different font in there if you wanted Configuration out the Wazuti. I'm not entirely sold on that. But I do like me some auto match. I guess as an example of something, we could also pop this in here. This is a stream all about experimenting with things, right? Then you could... Uh, but I say... the It... Autocomplete doesn't necessarily do anything if it's pulling stuff out of the buffer and there's nothing in this buffer for you to actually autocomplete in there. So I think there's another setting that you have to fiddle for that too, but uh, I haven't played with that for a little while. There is indeed a lot of, you know, hidden stuff in here. This is one of the, the fun aspects of coming up with videos for Sublime and thinking of that whole... What's going to be in the package development course when we create it? I have like a gigantic 80 video overview. And I, that's just to cover topics like what commands are, what the difference between a text command and an application command is, for example, if you didn't know why you would use one over the other and all of those other aspects. That doesn't even scratch the surface of the fact that there are these settings files that you can use to control various aspects of stuff which makes it hard to come up with a comprehensive course but it's fun if you want to be able to come up with uh you know video concepts on the fly particularly since i think this week's video is going to be a shorter uh how to convert color schemes from the old legacy format into the new format so if you were working on or using your own custom color scheme back in the day and you wanted to take advantage of that new ability to use variables it's very easy to convert from one way to the other which is actually something i recorded for the video that went out on monday but at 26 minutes i wasn't willing to add in an extra four minutes there uh, for that particular action Okay, so I'm going to close that. We're going to close that. I'm going to say, I'm, I'm really liking this little uh, glow effect on this operation here. It's one of the things that reminds me that I'm using a different version of Sublime that I might be, and I might otherwise uh, be expecting. Should this... Hmm. Uh, yeah, we're going to leave that as it is for now. Um, and this is going to be one of those commits that I'm probably going to fiddle around later. So I just want to be able to make sure that I save this code. So let's see. Uh, that's actually something that should be part of the other branch now that I think about it. Uh, so let's go ahead and let's do that. Let's stage that file. And then say, oh, 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 actually, no, we also need to do this, get the little error. Pretty sure there's something funky about the latest markdown syntax. I don't remember that being a... Huh. 
that is it's just so weird i'm not entirely sure the glow effect can be applied as uh to anything you want you can make the entire file glow if you wanted it's just uh it's one of the font styles like bold or italic that you can apply in one of your rules um before i forget uh 2.2 .2, we're going to say this is uh Fix a problem where some commands did not reload on package update. Important to have these sorts of things logged. Um, boop, boop. Okay, so we're going to say that the thing we are going to check in that and that. Oh, what's this untracked file? That's the little menu thing. Right on, right on. Okay, so the thing that we are checking in is fix reload issue one of the command files wasn't in the list of files that should be reloaded on package reload we'll commit those two files to that and then we got to come back over to here and wish we hadn't uh, done that yeah I delete that branch that we haven't done anything with and we're going to create a new branch here. Do, do, do. Context menu changes. OK, and then we'll just very quickly scan through. This is just all those changes and nothing else. So we'll stage all of those and this untracked file that is the menu and say alter how context menus work and commit cool all right now uh back to <laughs> your question there i wanted to make sure that i got that done uh if you look at user monokai i applied this glow effect to this specifically i'm only doing it in python things that have entity dot name so in python that's the case but if i did a C file. This is an entity dot name, but it's not glowing in that file, even though it is glowing in this file. That's because I specified that in this rule, the scope was source.python. We could take that part out like so. And then not only would it work in Python, but it would also work in C. And you could do the same thing for other things. Like if we, if you targeted you know, variable dot function, then function calls in Python would be glowy too. But for my purposes, you know, basically I, I only did that because the glow feature was added, and I thought I want to play with that. And the first thing I thought was, if entity, if I'm looking at plugins and entity names were glowy, then that would sort of provide a an extra draw for my eye to show me where each new method is starting because it looks a little bit, you know, glowy. Not technically needed or anything, but it, it seemed like a fun, a fun thing to play with. And now that I've done it, I kind of like it that way. Uh, but for the time being, I just have it set that way because mostly all I'm working with is Python stuff, and uh, I'm not entirely sure how how well that might work in other languages that I use. So there's that. Um, and the one thing I want to check is, uh, bu 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 oh. oh, feel free to uh, interrupt me with questions uh, anytime that you like. Uh, if it seems like I'm ignoring you, it's probably be I'm not. But you know, sometimes I get concentrating on what it is that I'm working on. But I do part of the reason of doing this is to be able to answer questions for people when they have them. But in in some cases, just to make sure that I don't forget that I need to do a thing, I need to jump off and do it. Like making that sample little commit up there to commit those things. I'll go back after the live stream and make the commit message my normal voluminous 20 miles of stuff uh, after the fact, but that'll make sure that it's totally saved up. Now, with uh, referring to other things, oh, oh wow, I, I, see what's, I see what's going on here. 
Ooh. I have been having this problem all day. Well, not all day, but since I sat down to get ready to do this live stream and realize that the YouTube live stream thing is completely different than what it used to be and having to set that up and realizing my odatnerd.net slash live link doesn't work anymore because every video has its own unique URL or something. At least I think it doesn't work. Um, but uh, I noticed that scratch buffer for markdown. Every time I do this, and create open a markdown file i get this error packages markdown markdown dot sublime syntax error in regex empty range in character class in regex bank and i'm like what the hell's up with that is there something wrong with the markdown syntax in this build of sublime there's probably something wrong with the markdown syntax in this build of sublime it's generating error messages about the markdown syntax and if i was to do this and look at an override report uh well thanks me for putting it over there of all the packages that i have overrides in right now markdown isn't one of them so why would that be the case and then i remembered over november i was using markdown for my devlog and that worked fine but um this morning someone asked a question on stack overflow about how to overcome how to override sublime text 3's packages completion syntax yeah let me see let me click oh shoot hang on let me copy this link from this tab that i don't want to disrupt from this window to paste it over to here like this uh this is the sort of thing that i do for fun during the day you know while i'm eating lunch i go over to stack overflow and look at problems people are having and this guy was having a problem because whenever he typed the text background and push tab it expands out to the full css thing with a semicolon but if he types background as soon as he types the colon it automatically adds the space and the semicolon but he didn't want the space to be added there because his muscle memory automatically types space every time he hits colon and he tried to modify the plugin to be able to do something uh, to fix it but that didn't actually work and so i actually answered his question and the reason for that is there's a key binding that is getting in the way um, and in order to answer that question i installed the css3 package and the CSS3 package requires you to disable the internal CSS package because they share the same scope. It's supposed to be a replacement. But uh, the Markdown syntax tries to embed CSS so that it can you can use code blocks. And I think that's why that's not working. Because this should be, it's text.plain because the Markdown syntax won't load right now. And if we did something like, like that should be something, right? And if I set the sit down to markdown, do we see anything happening? No, because there's an error loading that particular file. But if we were to remove package CSS3 and wait a little while for things to go, look at that. Now it totally works uh, because that syntax is removed. And we better. Re-enable the uh, original CSS file. Good example of how anything that requires you to disable internal packages because it's replacing them can be a little bit dicey because some pa you know it's possible for a package to refer to resources in other packages. For example, syntaxes can do that. That's how when you make an HTML page and you use JavaScript, it doesn't have a syntax definition for HTML and JavaScript. It just knows that when it sees a script tag, it should allow the rules from the already existing JavaScript tag to highlight and then come back to HTML when the script tag closes. And when the internal syntaxes do that, they assume that you're using the internal syntax, you know, like the Markdown one assumes that the CSS syntax that it's embedding is its internal one so if you replace it with something else some terrible things go awry and as we can see here um the uh where's the error message error loading css okay that was 
it saying the same sort of thing. But when it says this error in regex, empty range in character class, uh, that's everything related to the that there's an error and it might be in the markdown syntax or it might be in one of the syntaxes that was embedded in it, but the message doesn't necessarily tell you that. The error only tells you what it was trying to load at the time, which can make those sorts of problems harder to track, all things being equal. So thankfully we've resolved that because I've been curious about what could possibly have gone all wibbly wobbly on that one. Ooh, and according to the stream timer, I've been yammering on for two hours and 15 minutes or two hours and 31 minutes if you count that I spent 15 minutes live without actually being live, not trusting that that thing was actually encoding this video properly. That's, uh, that's pretty good. One other thing that I was going to work on, but... Clearly, I got sidetracked in this whole context menu thing and solving that another weird problem. Is the idea of a command that you could run from the command palette and like, say, view package file, but not view package file, where there would be a list of all of the packages. And when you pick one, it would be added to the command palette and then it would prompt you again so you could select a number of different items uh, with the idea being while you're looking at an override report like this assuming it was one that has expired things in it you could do something like freshen which won't excuse me which won't appear in this because I don't have any but if it would allow you to keep queuing up and say freshen, I want to freshen default and I want to freshen HTML and I want to freshen package resource viewer. And then when you're done, you trigger the command and it does all three of them. Right now, the only way to do that is from a context menu entry. So if you had multiples, you'd have to do them one at a time. I don't know offhand of a way to do something like this where you could keep adding arguments. Merge does it, though, um, when you push. You see, here's an example of we're pushing this branch, but if you back over it, it lets you choose the branch that you're interested in, right? Like master. And now it wants to know. Uh, it automatically populates that, but we might want to know what remote it's going to go to. And then we can choose that one as well. And then we get to choose the arguments. And when you actually pick that one, that's the last argument and it does the push. So imagine that there was a refreshing overrides in package, but instead of asking you for different arguments, it just kept saying, pick a package, pick a package, pick a package. And once you're done and you choose the item that says freshen from the top of the list, it just does it. I don't know that there's a way to do that directly, but I have a couple of hacky examples of Earth. I had a thought of a, well, maybe a hacky, maybe working as intended way to actually pull that off that I was going to work on tonight. But it is time for me to brush my teeth and go to bed because I still haven't fully recovered from whatever weird illness it was that I had at the end of December. I've been doing a lot of sleeping lately. So if you're interested in finding out about how to maybe do something like that or maybe not, then you have to chime in on uh, next week's live stream, which... Uh, Based on how this new system is going to work, I think I have to schedule right away as a copy of this one and see how all that stuff works. That stuff might be possible. Well, text input handlers only allow you to input actual lines of text. The other thing that you can do is a list input handler, which is what this is to allow you to see options. So I want to display the list of packages in there and allow you to choose multiples, but usually only allows you to populate arguments to commands so you'd have to have a command with a bunch of arguments but we're getting ahead of ourselves because that's something you're going to play with uh next week although with the stream being over you could of course ask questions in the discord or on the uh, forum as well incidentally did you i i answered the question uh that you had on the forum or rather you said something wasn't working but it was working for me i don't know if you went back and checked 
that thing. Uh, if it's still not working for you, we have to dig a little bit deeper into what might be different in what you're doing versus what I tried because it worked for me right off. Unless there was, you know, accidentally forgetting to execute the command that sets the setting before you use the one to view the setting. That's a little something people that watch this replay, we're going to have to go to the forum to be able to see uh, the result for. But that is, uh, oh, you know, you know what? Um, I'm not entirely sure how you're supposed to end one of these things. Let's see, that transition is set to fade. Um, and then, oh, I guess I could actually just do this the other way because I'm not doing that other thing anymore. So I could do something like this. Look at me, I'm wide on the screen now and I'm not entirely sure what the, the uh, frame rate on this thing is because sometimes it seems like it's working great and then other times it seems like it's really slow and I haven't been able to figure out uh, what the uh, case for that is. Um, takes 30% of a CPU to pull this stuff off of uh, a webcam and shoot it across the internet, though. That's interesting. In any case, um, uh, thanks uh, again for uh, watching the live stream. And remember that uh, I will be scheduling up next week's live stream. I think uh, my plan uh, going forward is to do it uh, at the same time on, on Tuesdays at uh, 8 o'clock. But I... Whoops. Bump the mic, boom. Um, I've been trying to sort of give names for what the general topic of the live stream is going to be, but I think I'm going to stop doing that because it requires new thumbnails to have stuff, and I'm not entirely sure how well that helps discoverability. Uh, but until the next <laughs> live stream, this is uh, Odette Nerd asking you to please have a sublime day. And, you know, don't notice how I have to spin my chair in this direction so that I can use a completely different laptop to find the red button that ends the stream. That didn't actually end the stream. Yes, I'm sure I want to end the stream. Seriously, this could be a lot more seamless, don't you think? Um, yeah, maybe this I need to win the lottery and hire a guy to sit at a laptop working the studio for me or something. <laughs>